My daughter's name is Lily Grace. One thing I remember that just really makes me smile is that um, she was so, so tiny, but her feet were weirdly big compared to the rest of her body. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on. We're so excited to hear about your little Lily and um, so thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to tell her story. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited to get to talk about her. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, uh, where are you guys located? What does your family look like um, now and maybe even at the time of Lily's birth? Yeah. Um, so I live in Pittsburgh with my husband, Chris, um, and we were living here at the time of Lily's birth and our pregnancy with her as well. Um, and our family looks like Chris and I, our dog Milo, um, Lily, and I'm actually 21 weeks pregnant with Lily's little brother right now. Oh, you are. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Hey, that's, um, thank you for coming on during this time. This is really, uh, Michelle, I'm, I am very, uh, it's no easy feat being pregnant after a loss. So thank you so much for coming on again. Yeah, um, of course. And uh, what do you and um, Chris do? Are you Tell us what you guys do, maybe professionally or um, in your spare time that you like to do as hobbies, as a family, or by yourself? Yeah. Um, so I actually am a pediatrician. I was a pediatric resident at the time that Lily was born, um, which meant I worked a lot of hours um, at crazy times, so didn't have a lot of time for hobbies. Um, and then Chris is a high school teacher. Um, and we like to to spend a lot of time outside. We like to take our dog for hikes and walks. Um, we like to bike some and then, um, yeah, just spend a lot of time playing with our dog. That is so great. So just a lot of activity and you guys are busy and I'm sure that you are probably really crazy with your hours. And then Chris has probably very naturally occurring hours. <laughs> yeah. His are a lot more <laughs> consistent. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, thank you. And then at the time of this recording, um, just so we have a little point of reference, how yeah. long ago, how many um, months ago was Lily born? Um, she, We just passed our one year anniversary of her birthday. So she was born one year and one week ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's so kind of new still. I personally yeah. think it is <laughs> still very fresh. So, um, so thank you for telling us a little bit about yourself. And um, so were you guys planning on getting pregnant? Was this something that was on your radar? You said you were a pediatric resident when you got, when you were pregnant and that does not seem like super conducive, good time to be pregnant, but I, you know, everybody has their own decisions to make in their lives. So, um, was that something you guys intentionally planned or was that a surprise? Um, yeah, we did plan actually. Um, we had just started trying and we were really lucky. We didn't have fertility issues, which I was just, completely convinced that we would. Um, so it was, it was a surprise in a surprise in a sense, but we were trying. Yeah. Awesome. And to, let's, uh, tell me a little bit about how that one, when you guys first found out that you were pregnant, um, so you were planning on it, you were a little surprised that you were, it was kind of easier, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so were you like excited, nervous, like you were, I'm sure you were like, oh man, this is an additional thing. <laughs> yeah. Gonna... Um, it was definitely a little bit overwhelming and exciting. Um, it was kind of funny. I actually found out when I was on an away rotation about mm. four hours away from Pittsburgh, which is unusual. It was the only time I did it one time for six weeks. Um, and I was there when I found out I was pregnant. 
Um, and I kind of took a test one morning, just I was like, I need to stop thinking about this, thinking that it was too early to test. And then I was really surprised when it was positive. Oh. Um, but I wasn't with Chris, which is kind of a bummer. So I told him a couple of days later when I came home for the oh, weekend. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I was like, how did you tell him? Like, yeah. did you call him? Or Okay, so you yeah. told him um, when you came home for, for a minute. So, yeah. Okay, well, good deal. And was he super excited? I'm sure he was. Yeah, he was super excited. He was also really surprised, um, but because he also thought that I wasn't even going to be testing yet. Um, so yeah, we were both just really excited. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It, it is always kind of like, yay, that's just, yeah, it's a super fun time. So how did your pregnancy go? Like, you, um, did you go into the hospital? Uh, sorry, did you go get a, a checkup? When did they, uh, yeah, when did you first go in? At what week did you go in to kind of have everything looked at, checked out? Yeah. Um, so my pregnancy was kind of complicated right from the beginning. Mm. Um, so I had, I started to have a little bit of spotting like I don't know, a week or so maybe after I had a positive pregnancy test, um, oh. and then started to have a little bit of pain. And so I called my OB who I had made an appointment with for like 12 weeks, but hadn't even been in to see yet. Um, and, and I was, four hours away. And they told me t- to go get an ultrasound there, um, to make sure I didn't have an ectopic pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went in and got that and thinking I was about five weeks or so, I think is what I thought. And then, um, I went in and it wasn't an ectopic pregnancy it was great, which was great. And there was a heartbeat, which we didn't expect thinking we were five weeks and we were eight weeks <laughs> pregnant. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. So I, had what I had thought had been a period, but it apparently was not. Um, so that was like a kind of a fun surprise that we got to fast forward three weeks through the first trimester. Yeah. Were you feeling sick at all? Actually? No, like a little bit nauseous, which is what made me Mm. like want to take that test, but not bad. Um, I really was feeling pretty good. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So everything looks okay. They just maybe, did they attribute the spotting to anything in particular? No, they just thought at that point that it was like not too much. And so they thought it's within normal first trimester spotting. And so okay. at that point just weren't very concerned. Okay. Um, and so said to come back at my, I believe it was a 12 week appointment that I had scheduled. Great. Were you um, back from your away rotation by that time that you went in for your 12 week? I was. um, That was not the next time we were seen. Oh, no. um, Okay. Tell me more then. Yeah, that's all right. Um, So we actually, we had scheduled the 12 week appointment, um, but then had also wanted to do the first trimester screening and just the way scheduling worked out, that was going to be at 11 weeks in a couple of days. So that was actually going to be first. And um, we were so excited to, cause I had gotten an ultrasound, but Chris hadn't been there. Um, so we were so excited to go to an ultrasound together. And then the morning actually of my first trimester screen, like early that morning at like three or four in the morning, I woke up and had a lot of bleeding. Um, oh. and it was really dramatic. And Chris and I were both a hundred percent convinced that we had miscarried. Like there was no way in our mind that that wasn't what happened. And, um, we were completely heartbroken. And so we, my appointment was for like seven o'clock that morning. And I had been trying to get in touch with the OB on call, but I was like, not particularly familiar with the practice yet. So I didn't really know how the system worked, but we just skipped the appointment because we're like, we're not going to go in. Like, what's the point? Um, and we hadn't been able to get in touch with them yet at our like seven o'clock appointment. And then later that morning, so we were just home and really sad. And, and then they called back and said, well, we really should have you go get an ultrasound. And I just remember being so upset that they were going to force us to go to a waiting room with a bunch of happy pregnant people and get an ultrasound to find out what we already knew. Um, and so I was kind of upset, but okay, fine. We'll do it. Um, so they got us in for another ultrasound, like an emergency ultrasound appointment later that morning. Um, and we went in and it was pretty excruciating to like sit in the waiting room and, um, wait for that. And then we went in, I remember them asking like, Oh, what brings you in? And we were like, well, (laughs) I think I'm miscarrying. So, and then they 
put the ultrasound probe on. I didn't even look at the screen because I didn't want to see. And they were like, well, there's a heartbeat. Everything looks good. And like, <laughs> we were just like completely shocked because there, neither of us, I think, had any amount of hope. We were just completely mm. convinced that yeah. we had lost the baby. Did, okay. But did they yeah. attribute any of the bleeding that time to anything? Like a, a like a hemorrhage or, is, you know, like yeah. the, the subchorionic hemorrhage? They said they should have been able to see if it was a subchorionic hemorrhage. They should have still been able to see a little bit of evidence of that. But they and they couldn't, but that was kind of the best guess. But they said there doesn't look to be any ongoing bleeding. Like there was no signs in my placenta or anything at that point that they could tell, um, which was kind of unsatisfying. Yeah. Um, but also like reassuring and unsatisfying. Um, yeah. At the same time. Oh man, I like the amount of emotions that you guys probably felt that day in like what? Yeah. Eight, seven eight hours or something is... yeah it was exhausting for sure I, yeah we were both just were like this is the biggest emotional roller coaster up yeah. to that point that we had been on yeah 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 okay so that was around 11 a mm-hmm. little a little over 11 weeks when you went in for them yeah but you didn't go to a- the actual OB appointment you just got that ultrasound <laughs> yeah I still hadn't been to the OB until a few days later okay so you um, did get an appointment yep. in okay yeah so how and how the, was the bleeding kind of subsiding gone? Yeah, the bleeding was it lasted for a, a couple of weeks, I think, but it was much less. It was much, much less. It was like a ton all at once and then was like spotting again. So they were like, well, I was like, so does this mean that my risk is the same as anyone else's risk? And they're like, well, we always prefer people don't have bleeding, <laughs> but we like there's nothing to show that anything looks concerning necessarily right now. And so we'll just like continue. And at that point I was 12 weeks, which, you know, is supposed to feel like the time when things feel safer. Um, but yeah, it took us a while to like actually feel hopeful or confident at all. Again, I would say it took us a good, probably few weeks to a month to actually kind of settle in again to thinking that and getting excited yeah Yeah. okay yeah and we had been about to tell people um at 12 weeks and then we yeah delayed that a little bit we still told our families um Mm -hmm. but we delayed telling other people till I think like 17 or so 16 or 17 weeks okay so just a little bit later then and tell me, um, I forgot to ask this, Where are you guys both from Pennsylvania area or are you like, I just wasn't sure, like, did you call your family and let them know yeah. or? Um, yeah. So Chris's family lives in Pittsburgh. They're all okay. really close by. Um, I'm from Colorado originally. And so oh, okay. my parents are still in Colorado. Um, so I actually, my poor mom, I called my mom on the morning that I thought I miscarried Yeah. to tell her that I had had a miscarriage. Um, And then called her back later that day and was like, just kidding, I guess. Um, So so that's how she got to find out, which was not how we would have wanted. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And then we told Chris's parents a few days later and the rest of his family, which that was fun. And so that um, it was fun to get to tell them in person. And that was like a little piece of pregnancy normalcy. Yeah. there. Okay. So that is looking good. Are you guys doing any sort of genetic testing? Cause it usually, I mean, you can get it around that time if you wanted to do genetic testing. Yeah. So when we had gone in for the ultrasound on the day, we were supposed to have our first trimester mm-hmm. screen with like the nuchal translucency and the blood work. Um, they were like, they said, everything looks good. I was like, okay, well then while we're here, can you still do the nuchal translucency? (laughs) And they were able to, which was nice. Um, and I got the blood work and not really thinking anything of it. And then about a week later, um, so after I had seen my OB, um, we got the call that it came back as high risk for trisomy 21. And so then they recommended the genetic testing, which we got and then that came back normal about another week or so later. So there was another little roller coaster bump in oh, there. Oh man, yeah. Okay, yeah. um really quickly before um uh, just to clarify, um can yeah. you explain what a nuchal trans um transparency is so that others know what that is in and, oh, and then yeah. what would lead you to go on and get the genetic testing? Yeah. Yeah, of course. So it's the nuchal the first trimester screen is lab work that they get a bunch of labs on at the same time that you get an ultrasound that looks at 
the nuchal translucency is like the thickness on the back of baby's neck um, at some particular measurement. And then they put all of, they put, I think they put in your age and everything um, and any other risk factors into a calculator with the nuchal translucency measurement, as well as the lab work. And they calculate mm-hmm. out your risk uh, for different genetic abnormalities. Yeah. And so that, which led you to like, oh, you're a little, probably a little higher risk. And so mm-hmm. go ahead and get the genetic testing. Yeah. And what did the genetic testing come back as? Yeah. So it came back as normal chromosomes, no trisomy 21. Um, and we were not finding out the gender. So we didn't look oh. at the, <laughs> um, at whether it was a boy or girl. So we had, I had my OB call me with those results, even though they were on my phone, but I didn't want to open them. Yes. They said it would be very obvious if it was a boy or girl when I opened those. So we, um, yeah, we didn't look at that. That is really fun. I think that's like the ultimate surprise. Like, yeah, <laughs> boy, girl, <laughs> um, were you guys hoping for a boy or girl? Was there, uh, did it matter? Were you guys excited? <laughs> no, we, um, we didn't really, I think have a preference, but, um, we were having an easier time with, um, boy names. Like we kind of had mm. one boy name picked out. So then we thought it might be a girl. <laughs> and it, Yeah. So, um, but not really, we didn't. And, and neither of us had like strong feelings that it was one or the other. Okay. So, okay. Well, so. fun still. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've had the, uh, that come back. That was okay. Um, and then th- your next one would probably be the major one would probably be the anatomy scan at 20 weeks, mm-hmm. around 20 weeks. Is that, uh, did you have it around that time? Yep, we had it at 20 weeks. Um, and so like in between that time, we had finally had like a little bit of normalcy um, and started to feel hopeful again. And we're like, okay, that bleed is behind us. There's no reason to think anything is wrong. And you're feeling okay too. Like, yeah, I actually felt physically really great um, throughout. I never really had much nausea. Um, I was really lucky in that way. Um, I was feeling good. We went on a big trip, like right at the end of my first trimester, went hiking through a bunch of national parks, which, um, was probably a bold move. Um, knowing how sick I've been this pregnancy, but it worked out fine because I felt great during that pregnancy. And so we did a ton of hiking and it was really fun. Yeah. So that was like a little sweet spot and, um, leading up to the 20 week ultrasound. So then we went into the, um, ultrasound and of course knew that they could find things wrong, but weren't really worried about it. Um, I was, I was more convinced of wanting to have a surprise on the sex of the baby. So I was really worried about accidentally finding out that I feel like was my worry going into, um, the scan. And then they were going through all the things. They kept pointing out all the organs that looked good, which was great. And I, it was my first anatomy scan ever. So I didn't really think anything of how long she was taking on some of the things. Um, didn't think much of it when the tech stepped out of the room a few times and came back and had noticed when they measure like all of the, like they measure their leg length and mm-hmm. their head circumference. And at least um, where we get our ultrasounds done, it shows like how many weeks they're estimated to be based yeah. on those measurements. Yeah. And we had noticed like that they seemed a little bit behind, like it was fewer weeks than 20 weeks, what we were, but I wasn't really paying that much attention. Um, but I had noticed a couple of those and then like a lot of weeks behind, like, give me, I had only noticed a couple that looked like, like 19 weeks or okay. like, um, 18 weeks and like six days or something. So nothing that seemed too okay. alarming to me. Okay. Um, and then the tech left the room again. And at that point and was like, Oh, I, there might be some more images we need to get. Um, baby wasn't being the most cooperative, so we couldn't get quite all of the, um, mm-hmm. things that they needed to. So I thought that that was it, that they just like wanted to get a more experienced tech that was going to have different tricks up their sleeve to yeah. get the different angles. Like I think they couldn't get her spine. Um, and so I didn't think too much of it. Um, and then she came back in with the doctor who it wasn't, I would say it wasn't my best experience with the doctor that I've had during this time. Um, but she basically was like, your baby's way too small. And that is a really bad sign that they're way too small at this time. Um, and that can mean a bunch of different things and you'll talk to your OB about it. Um, and kind of left it at that. 
I think she also thought that since I am a physician, that my, that my knowledge was different than what, but I'm not an OB. And yeah. in that moment, it wouldn't have mattered if I was an OB, like I was a patient and I was a mom. So yeah. that was really, really scary. And actually like the measurement, like when we got the final report with the measurements, some of them were like 17 weeks, like already super, like very far behind. I hadn't noticed those when they were going through it, but she was really, really small. And that's so, all she said. She just basically said, you got to go talk to your OB about it. Like, pretty, there was- I mean, she said like, it could be infection. It could be genetic. It could be the placenta. Um, and was like, so you'll figure out next steps with your OB to figure it out. That's at least what I remember. I also recognize that it was a traumatic moment, um, right. but that's, that's how it felt to me. Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what just happened? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it was like, everything looked good. Like, I think that's what was so surprising too, is that like all the organs and everything looked good that we saw. There were a couple that we couldn't get that time, but in yeah, general, we, everything else looked good. Everything looked good. Yeah. Um, and we actually had to have a dedicated fetal echo too of her heart because mm. I have a heart condition that can be inherited. And so that was like already pre-planned that we would get that. So we actually had that right after the anatomy ultrasound, we went there, the heart looked perfect. Mm. They were like, well, from that perspective, like everything looks fine. Baby looks great, which was good, I guess. But at that point it was just really scary. Yeah. Um, talk about, yeah. Talk about worry setting in. I just, yeah. Again, (laughs) When you, okay, so then you have this knowledge that something may be up and uh, did you guys have a, a follow-up appointment with your OB shortly after? Were you able to get in that quickly? Um, So we got in, I think a few days later, but we talked to them later mm. that day, which felt like an eternity trying to get um, a hold of someone that day. But we did hear from them later that day and they were kind of like, well, you were a little bit unsure about your dating at first. Um, and so, but they were like, and also your genetic testing, you already had that and that was fine. So they were like, well, let's just see, like, if, if baby is tracking, we'll get another ultrasound in like three to four weeks. And if baby is tracking on the same growth curve, then it's probably not a whole lot to worry about. Um, and they, in the meantime, had me do a bunch of lab tests to see if I'd been infected and like, I hadn't been sick at all, but just to make sure that I hadn't gotten infected with something that right. I hadn't realized, um, which that all came back, um, normal as well. Um, okay. and, but they also wanted me to see MFM or the high risk obese, um, in the meantime as well. When you did finally get to talk to your doctor, I mean, so that was kind of the conclusion, like we're going to yeah. check back in three to four weeks ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And how did that, how did she look then? Yeah. So, um, so in the, we had met with MFM about a week after that ultrasound too. Um, and we had kind of felt a little more reassured after talking to ROB of like, Mm -hmm. okay, this baby's just going to be small. Like, um, I, the babies in my family weren't particularly small, but Chris and all, and his sisters, like they were all small. It was like, it's just going to be a small baby. Everything's going to be fine. Um, And then we met with MFM and at that point they said it in hindsight, now knowing that she wasn't growing well, they looked back at that first trimester screen lab work that had been abnormal. Um, and they said, well, it, it flagged as high risk for trisomy 21, which the baby doesn't have based on the genetics, but one, the one marker that was the most abnormal is an indicator that the placenta is struggling. So they really thought that, um, the growth restriction was because of the placenta at that point, which also fit with, there was no sign of infection and her Mm -hmm. genetics had looked good. Um, and she had no other anatomic concerns that raised that made genetics seem super likely. Um, and what she also told us was because it was likely the placenta that, I was like, so in best case scenario, baby just grows and is small. And she said, realistic best case scenario is you get to 31 or 32 weeks and develop preeclampsia. Um, and need best to, case scenario. Yeah. Um, and need to, or just hypertension, maybe yeah. not necessarily preeclampsia right. um, and need to deliver because of you, like, because the placenta is not working and then it causing problems to my health. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was 
a lot to take in, um, that like readjusting our like goal to be 31, 32 weeks. Um, yeah. Cause that is a huge time difference, like a huge time difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And, um, like I have worked in the NICU, I was taking care of premature babies. And so I, I know that 31, 32 week baby, I was just kept trying to tell Chris, like most of those babies do great. Like I know not all of them do great, but most of them really do. It'll be okay. Like it'll be a long NICU stay and that'll be really hard, but like, that's okay. And we actually had um, gone to Colorado to visit my parents like mm-hmm. during this time too. Um, and I just like have vivid memories of conversations we had like while hiking and things in Colorado of just really trying to process um, what our new reality might look like. Yeah. So they kind of gave you uh, the possible solution. I mean, not possibly um, the possibility that at you at 31, 32 weeks, you'd be delivering. Did they give you the worst case scenario? Did they talk about any of that with you? Um, they did. Um, they had said we were at higher risk of stillbirth, um, but didn't really like, I, not that I remember like quantified what, how high. Um, and mm-hmm. like, they did make clear, like they weren't sure that we would make it to 32 weeks before baby started being in distress. Um, yeah. but they were like, we'll just have to see, like, we'll see what the growth shows at 23 weeks, um, and kind of go from there. Okay. So, uh, you came back from your trip, I'm assuming from Colorado had mm-hmm. that 23, 24 week ultrasound. How did she look then? Um, so she was even smaller. I mean, oh. she was growing, but she was like falling off of her curve. So she yeah. was more behind, which was really hard. And we, at that time we were paying very close attention to all the measurements on the screen and how many weeks. So we kind of knew we were like, Oh, well, she's bigger, but we knew that things were not what we had hoped that we, we I think it was a, right about three weeks and we had hoped that she had grown exactly we had hoped that she had grown exactly three weeks during that time. Um, and we could tell by our own, um, watching the measurements that that wasn't true. And then the other thing they did at that ultrasound because of her growth restriction was they did a Doppler of the umbilical artery to look at whether they look for, well, what she ended up having was reversed end diastolic flow. So like at different parts of the heart rate and blood, instead of going to her, through the umbilical cord was coming from her because of the placenta being so sick or so bad. Oh, so they saw, they were able to see that happening at that time. Yeah. Which is what they, they hadn't explicitly told us that that was like the thing they were looking for that was going to be bad. Um, but I had remembered from medical school, like that's bad. Um, And we actually had gotten that ultrasound at a different hospital um, where MFM wasn't and um, where ROB wasn't. And so the tech had tried to call them to figure out our next steps, um, but she wasn't able to get in touch with them. So she said, you guys can just go ahead and go home and they will call you shortly. Like I paged them, they'll be Mm -hmm. calling you shortly, but you don't need to wait here because it was it's not a hospital that does OB except for the ultrasounds. So we went out to the parking garage and we, and then I got a call while we were in the car from MFM that said, you need to come to triage right away um, because of the reverse and diastolic flow. So just like try to come straight here. And I just remember at that point when I hung up the phone, just like breaking down the like, I just remember saying to Chris, like, I don't think we're going to get a princess baby home. Sorry. Um, So, yeah, that was a really bad day. Um, So then we headed straight to triage. It was only like a 10 minute drive between the two hospitals. Um, and we went straight to triage and again, a similar situation of waiting in the waiting room, um, with all these women with their packed bags and their big bellies, um, and smiles on their faces and us just really scared. 
Um, and we got into triage and, um, fortunately the doctor that was there was just so kind and all the nursing oh. staff, everybody was so, so kind that day. And what she said is that the reverse end diastolic flow is a really bad sign that the placenta is failing. Um, and that baby didn't look to be in any distress at that point, which was great. They had done a biophysical profile too, I guess, to met, which like measures the wellness of the baby doing a bunch of different things. And she had gotten a full, four full points there. Um, so they yeah. said, she's not in any distress now. Um, but she could be at any time. Um, and so they actually recommended admission, um, to until delivery at that point. And you were at 23 weeks. I was at 23 and two. Um, 23 and two. Okay. Yeah. And so our hospital um, offers resuscitation starting at 23 weeks. Okay. Um, so they actually, while we were, so I said, because I have been in the NICU and I've taken care of kids long after the NICU that are born that early. And I know that the outcomes <laughs> are really not always the best. Um, and so I said, well, what if, what if we wouldn't want resuscitation this early, do we still need to be admitted? And they said, no, if you, if you wouldn't want resuscitation, there's no need to admit, but like talk to our NICU team while you're here, which was great. So they had the NICU team come to talk to us in triage um, which is just an odd dynamic. It's like they were people I knew, I had on work with. Um, and they kind of talked to us about all the risks of prematurity to that degree. Um, and the hard thing too was she wasn't only just 23 weeks at that point, she was also really small. Right. Um, and so I remember they had a calculator that they like calculated their outcomes based on a number of factors. And the lowest weight on the calculator was higher than her estimated weight oh. at that point. Um, so they couldn't even put her in and they weren't sure if we delivered then, if they would even be, if they would even have equipment small enough, um, to, cause to she was anything. just so, so small. And so that began the worst decision ever. Um, sorry. Um, we had to work with our teams with MFM and with NICU, um, and most importantly with Chris and I to figure out at what gestational age, given how tiny she was, um, at what gestational age we would want to be, uh, that we would want resuscitation and would want to deliver her, um, with the plan to be that there was no need to be in the hospital before then, because there's no need to monitor for distress um, if you're not going to do anything about it. And that just adds a lot of stress to us yeah. <laughs> to be in the hospital, just waiting for something terrible to happen for weeks. Yeah. And so that appointment, that ultrasound and that triage visit was on a Friday. And then I think we had an appointment again with MFM and NICU on the following Tuesday, kind of after we'd had a little bit of time to process it as best we yeah. could, um, and think about it and consider, um, all the options, um, which, I mean, they had offered the option of, um, ending the pregnancy as well at that point, um, in Pennsylvania, it's legal until 24 weeks. So we had like a five day window and we, we did consider it, um, which I just say, because people don't know until they're faced with horrible decisions. Um, and ultimately because my health still looked good at that point, my blood pressure was still okay. Um, my OBs were not worried about my health that it, seemed worth it to, um, to continue with the pregnancy, to give baby a shot at making it until a later age, um, when they would have a good chance. Um, 
And so anyway, at that appointment, a few days later, when we met with all of them, we had a ton more discussions about the details of risks to me, to the baby, um, of what outcomes would look like. And of course, it's just so hard to predict. They can't tell me, they can't, they just can't tell you if your baby's going to be one that is a miracle baby in the NICU that has no problems despite having all the odds against them, or, um, if they're going to just suffer a lot. And we, so we ultimately decided on 28 weeks as, and like with the anticipated extra growth that we thought she might get in that time, we had decided on 28 weeks. That was the plan. Um, And MFM had offered me to come in for like weekly heart check because I wasn't feeling a ton of movement. I had felt some kicks and Chris got to feel some kicks. But because she was so small and it was still early, yeah. um, I wasn't feeling a ton. And so there wasn't going to be a ton to tell me that things were going okay yeah. or the baby. W- and by that, I mean, just the baby was even still alive. Um, yeah. And so they had, they offered me to come in weekly to check just that there was a heartbeat just so that I didn't have to wait a full three weeks or four weeks, whatever it was. Um just at home wondering. Um, and so we did that. I went in every week for heart tone checks and there was a heartbeat. Um, and, and then the plan was to get another growth ultrasound at 26 weeks. That was the plan. So I think there was just two weeks where I needed the heart tone checks. Okay. Okay. Um, and so I had gone in at 24 weeks and 25 weeks, um, and listened to baby's heart rate heartbeat and it sounded great each time but it was just the most agonizing weeks um of trying to decide if we made the right decision um just wondering at all times like should we go in now um and just waiting for those next appointments and then we had our next growth scan our 26 weeks scan was scheduled um the tuesday after labor day I was 26 and six at that appointment and I, my anxiety was <laughs> extremely high yeah. um, and, and my blood pressure was getting higher too, which okay. didn't help my anxiety yeah. um, and vice versa. Yes. I just remember talking to Chris over Labor Day weekend. I, we had been, when we were deciding on what gestational age, like the 26 to 28 week range was where it was really hard for us to figure out what the right decision was. Um, we felt pretty confident that like at 23 weeks with how tiny she was, that she didn't have a good chance, but we weren't sure at the 26 to 28 week range. And so we had decided that if we went in for that ultrasound and she was showing any signs of distress that we would just get admitted to the hospital and induce. And so that was a really long, long weekend. Um, Three days never felt so long. And I was just sick to my stomach um, with anxiety, especially like that night before. Um, I don't think I slept at all. I swear I felt a kick um, that night. I don't know if it was a kick or not, but I swear I felt a kick. Uh, our, thankfully our ultrasound was the very first thing in the morning. It was another like 7 a.m. scan. Um, and we went in and, um, fortunately the waiting room was empty cause it was so early. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they took us back for the ultrasound. Um, and at this point we'd had a number of ultrasounds. So both of us were getting better at <laughs> looking at things. Yeah. The tech just kind of really quickly moved through things. Um, and I remember thinking it doesn't really look like baby's moving, but she wasn't really a big mover on ultrasound. So she was Mm. often pretty still. So I was like, no, like, I don't know. I can't tell. Um, and then I definitely didn't see her stop a a heartbeat, but I, I wasn't sure. And then, um, when they like show the flat, like the, the wiggly lines where yeah. you expect to see the heartbeat, she just did it really quickly. And I was like, I don't think it looks right. Um, but I 
wasn't totally sure. And then she started doing some measurements. And so I was like, well, maybe everything is okay because why would she do measurements if there wasn't a heartbeat? Um, and so she did a quick measurement of the head and femurs. Um, and I remember thinking like, okay, she grew again. Like a, I could tell again, like falling farther behind, but had still grown since the last ultrasound. Yeah. And I was like, it's just, I don't know, something doesn't seem right, but she's still measuring. But then she only measured like two measurements and we had done these. We knew that they did a lot of measurements when they're yeah. doing a growth ultrasound. And she said, okay, I got all I need. So oh. I'm going to go get the doctor and they'll be in to talk to you. And at that point I knew like they did not get everything they need. Well, they did get everything they needed, but, yeah. um, and when she stepped out, Chris and I just looked at each other and I don't know who said it first, but one of us said, I don't think there was a heartbeat. And the other one like, said the same. Um, and so then the doctor came in and she was also so lovely and kind. And she just said, I have bad news. And I said, there's not a heartbeat. And she said, yeah, there's not a heartbeat. Um, and at that point, uh, we just completely fell apart. We stayed in the ultrasound room for a while, just crying. And the doctor kind of came and went, um, like giving us time and checking in. And um, she um, asked if we wanted to talk about next steps or if we wanted to go home. Um, and I remember Chris, like, and then she stepped out to give us time. And I remember Chris being like, what are, what next steps? Like the baby died. Like, um, I was like, I'm going to have to deliver the baby still. And so eventually they moved us to another room, which was nice to not be in that ultrasound room anymore. Um, it was just like an office with a desk. I don't think it was a patient room at all, but, um, but, and again, kind of like, I feel, I don't know, time was such a blur, so I have no idea, but the doctor came kind of just like kept coming in and checking and leaving, um, to like see where we were at in terms of being ready to discuss, um, next steps. Um, and at one point during that, when she had stepped out, we decided we didn't want to surprise anymore in terms of the sex of it. That didn't seem fun at that point. Um, and so we, but, and the answer was on my phone. It had always been on my phone. Um, I just hadn't looked. And so we looked at that point and found out we were having a girl, um, <laughs> which was like, obviously so bittersweet. Yeah. And the only thing we like I said we didn't I really don't think we had a gender preference really but um when the NICU had talked to us they kept asking us if it was a boy or a girl and we finally were like we don't know but like why and they said well the statistics are like girls do a little bit better um in the NICU and I just remember finding out it was a girl and like feeling heartbroken that like maybe she would have been the miracle baby yeah. But, and so we, uh, and, uh, so sometime in there, we t heard about what our options were. And because she was so small, she was measuring like a 23 weeker at 26 and six. Um, and so they did give us the option that we could do a surgical procedure um, rather than induction, um, but that we want to go hold the baby and see the baby. And so uh, I feel fortunate enough that I had not anyone like super close to me that had experienced stillbirth, certainly no one that I knew their experience well, but enough exposure a little bit that I just knew that people had always talked about like pictures and holding the baby being really helpful. So I feel grateful that I was able to know that to make the decision to be induced um, so that we would get to hold her. 
Yeah. Um, and they gave us the option of we could go home. We could come back that night. We could come back the next day. Um, again, like my blood pressure was pretty high, but within a range that they were like, we have time if you want to prepare, <laughs> whatever that means. Yeah. Um, and we just decided that we couldn't imagine like going home and then having to come back. So we just got admitted straight, um, straight to labor and delivery from the ultrasound. Michelle, did you, did you end up calling your families or by this time or was it a little bit later on? I, I was trying to remember that. I think it was a little bit, I'm not totally sure. (laughs) Sometime that morning we did. Um, I'm not sure if it was when we were still downstairs or when we were up in labor and delivery. I know, um, Chris like had called his dad because he needed him to come like pick up the dog and like take care of those kind of things. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Sometime, sometime (laughs) during that morning we told people, um, but I, it's a blur of when that happened. Yeah. We got admitted up to labor and delivery and it was, I mean, it was just kind of the same thing again, sitting in that triage waiting room, like with all these people who, um, are so happy, um, and just like falling apart in the waiting room. And they had called to like, make sure that they had a room for us and things. So I hoped that that meant that we would not have to wait in the waiting room. And unfortunately we still did not for a super long time, but, um, and we didn't have to like do the check-in process, thankfully, but, um, we still had to sit in there for a little bit. And then, um, they took us back to the room and I just, I worked at that hospital, um, for my NICU and newborn rotation. So I had been to those labor and delivery rooms and I knew that they were taking us to like the far back room, um, which I know was an act of kindness um, so that we would be as far from like crying babies as we could. But it just was like another piece of reality that yeah, um, <laughs> they would never put a, a preemie Um, baby that was going to be born alive in that far room because it's the farthest from the NICU Uh, and so it was just uh, really hard to be put there Um, and then then I remember I suddenly became very fixated on eating Um, I was very hungry (laughs) Um, I don't know like I was just in shock I guess and I hadn't eaten breakfast that morning because I was so sick with anxiety um and I was like they're like okay like you're only gonna be able to drink now like clear liquids while you're being induced and I was like this is not gonna work we need food (laughs) um I because I in my head this is gonna take days and days yeah um yeah and so I yeah I think Chris was a little bit alarmed at how (laughs) fixated on food I was <laughs> um but yeah it's kind of a funny memory now um and ultimately we ordered food from this restaurant like a- across the street from the hospital that we went to um and got good food ate a lot of food um and yeah that I don't know that was just a funny light moment I guess yeah. <laughs> of a horrible day um and then I remember they were like, okay, well just let us know. Like once you're done eating, we can start induction. Um, and just like having to hit the call light <laughs> to say like, I'm ready, um, uh, was hard, but I also didn't want to have, I, yeah, but I had a really wonderful, wonderful nurse, Corey, and I knew she wasn't going to keep coming in and asking, are you ready yet? <laughs> so I knew I was going to have to call out at some point. Um, and so um, we did that. We started the medications. Um, and again, just thinking like I wasn't in any sort of preterm labor, so mm-hmm. they, we're starting from scratch. Um, yeah. and so they, it was going to be a while. Um, Chris left to go. We didn't have a bag packed. We certainly yeah. didn't bring it that day. Yeah. Um, and so he went home for a little bit and, uh, met his dad at our house to, um, 
have him pick up the dog and everything and make sure he had what he needed. Um, and fortunately we live close to the hospital too, but my, one of my best friends, she, um, we, I mean, she was also, was also a resident with me and she, so she had a badge that worked to the hospital and we hadn't really asked yet about guests. We knew that the visitor policy because of COVID was yeah. two guests uh, or two visitors, but I hadn't really asked if there were any exceptions or anything. It hadn't occurred to me. Um, and so she like came in with her badge <laughs> so that she wouldn't have to be one of my visitors. Uh, oh. <laughs> and so she sat with me while Chris went home so that I wouldn't be alone. Um, which was just so kind. Yes, that is. Um, yeah. That was kind of lucky too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I started getting really sick. Well, poor thing. She came to like, just sit with me, which already I'm sure was like a lot to, to do. Um, and then I got started getting really sick from the induction mm. while well, she was here. So after all that, that I had wanted to eat a ton of food, it turned out to not be not- worth it because <laughs> it all came right back up. Oh no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But that's a good friend. Um, yes. She was holding my hair back and really caring for me. Um, and then Chris came back shortly thereafter um, and she left so we could be together. And then, I don't know, it was kind of a blur. By then it's afternoon. I don't know kind of what happened that afternoon. Um, I remember... I guess kind of from the time we got to labor and delivery, just, it felt, it felt like every person that walked in the room would ask us about if we wanted an autopsy, if we had a plan for what to do with her body, like all of these questions that just felt so overwhelming. Um, They're like super heavy questions. And you're like, I'm not in the right state of mind to answer these questions. Why are you asking me? Because they kept, it was like, as it, because we didn't hadn't answered them yet, they kept me because they couldn't fill out their forms. So, yeah. for, and so, so then people, and then it made us feel like we had to decide. Everyone could be like, "Oh no, no, you can wait to decide." But then the next person would ask us ten minutes later, um, and so yeah, that was just really, really overwhelming. And um, yeah, and that that afternoon was yeah just a blur. I know we started to talk about names a little bit. Mm. and because we had known it was a girl so we hadn't decided on a name um did and, you have a running list by then though yeah so we did um we had it down to two names for girls at that point neither of them is lily <laughs> <laughs> um we had two names and i remember actually i think it was downstairs when we were still in the ob's office we when we found out it was a girl we like very briefly talked about names and now this feels so wrong, but it's just where I was at the time, um, that we both kind of felt like, well, we don't want to quote unquote, waste our names on this baby. That's not going to live. Um, which is so insane to me now, but I'm so happy her name is Lily. So it yeah. doesn't bother me at all in that sense. Cause it feels like her name got to where it was supposed to be. Um, but yeah, it's just like where we were that we just didn't understand. I don't know if we didn't understand like the depth of how much love we already had for her and would develop, Continue. but yeah. yeah. How do you know until you're, you do it? But yeah, so we, um, but so I said to Chris, we kind of decided we weren't going to use either of those two names and Lily, I think Lily had come up at some point. But, and we had both been like, yeah, we like it, but it's not like in our, it doesn't beat X name, whatever. Um, But sometime after that 23 week scan, when things were really bad, I had this like moment when I was just like doing something around the house um, where I just had a moment where I thought, I think it's a girl, um, which is not something I had felt before. And I said, and I think her name is Lily. Like that just came to me in that Mm -hmm. moment. And it was just very odd. And I, yeah, didn't think a lot about it. Um, But I guess it had stayed in my mind. And then in the hospital, I said, well, I told Chris that I don't even think I had told him that story yet. Um, Oh, wow. And so I told him that that had happened and that I really liked the name Lily. Um, 
And we looked up what the meaning of it was. And it means like pure and innocent. Like that feels right. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's so beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. So we, we picked that sometime that afternoon. We still didn't know what her middle name was going to be. We Mm -hmm. knew that. Um, And then um, I started to get a lot more uncomfortable that afternoon. And I, yeah, the pain just started to get bad. I was still having side effects from all the induction meds Mm. and just like really not feeling well. I didn't want to get an epidural yet um, because in my head. But you were okay getting an epidural at some point in time. Yeah, I was planning to get an epidural um, and I like was planning to probably in any labor that I was going to have, but okay, I okay. definitely plan to then, but for some reason I just, uh, I think I thought the pain was going to get worse. Like I wanted to save it for like, uh, <laughs> like when things got really bad, like that was where my head mind was at. Um, and so I was in a ton of pain and I was like, but not the epidural yet. Like, um, so I got an IV pain med instead and it just like, it helped a tiny bit with the pain, but mostly just like knocked me out. Oh. Um, which I got a couple hour nap probably, which was probably good for me. Yeah. But then I was in this weird state where I was like awake, like I could hear everything happening. I could understand everything happening, but oh. I like couldn't move or open my eyes really. Yeah. Uh, so no one knew I was awake. And I just remember hearing like people coming in and out of the room and talking to Chris and me like not really knowing who they were. Cause I couldn't open my eyes to yeah. see. Um, and just like, it was a very like weird twilight zone <laughs> afternoon. Yeah. And, and I remember at one point just like, again, like he thought I was still dead asleep because I appeared to be dead asleep and he was just like sobbing in there oh. at one point when no one was in there. Um, and that was just a really heartbreaking moment. Um, Cause he, he had been breaking down. Like he definitely broke down in the ultrasound room and he, but he, I know he was trying to be strong for me in ways too. Um, yeah. and trying to like do the logistic things like get clothes yeah. at home. And, yeah. um, and so then to just hear that moment of him just falling apart when he thought I wasn't aware was really painful. Yeah. And then uh, things went on. I still was super uncomfortable. And I remember my sweet, sweet nurse, she was about to leave for the night. Um, and she had arranged, she had changed her schedule so that she could come back and be our nurse the next day, which was oh. so kind. Yeah. Um, and we were just so relieved that we would have a familiar face um, who had cared for us so well. And she said, okay, what's your pain on a scale of one to 10? where 10 is the worst pain in your life and I said seven and Chris goes okay I'm just curious like what's the worst pain you had in your life (laughs) if not this (laughs) I was like oh I mean I think 12 hours from now I imagine the pain will be worse (laughs) that's why I'm like (laughs) um because I had also I was only like one centimeter at that point and I was like I can't be in this much pain. Like, this is, I'm yeah. just being a wimp. Like <laughs> anyway, so but then he finally convinced he and my nurse Corey convinced me that there was it was gonna work. Like <laughs> pain relief was gonna stay yeah. for the next 12 hours. Helpful. It epidural. will be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got the epidural and they were right. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I mean, I know epidurals like vary and different they work differently for different people at different yeah. times, but I had a great epidural and I <laughs> immediately oh, felt so much better. And oh good. Was like able to just like think and be present in a way that in some ways was really excruciatingly painful, but also was like really important to feel like I was actually there rather yeah. than just coping through the pain. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So got the epidural. That was good. Um, and then we could like, you know, figure out a middle name. Yeah. <laughs> I can think straight. I, I kind was like of. actually a person. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, the next time they came in to check me was a few hours later. And then I was nine centimeters. So I was like, okay, so that's why I hurt so much because I was like 
It was only one centimeter, but I was about to be nine. Oh um, my goodness. That was fast. <laughs> yeah. It went really fast. Um, and yeah. So that made me feel justified in the epidural <laughs> and I was glad I already had it. I was yep. like, oh shoot. Um, but then I also just remember thinking like, oh, nine centimeters, like that's so close to 10. Like I'm going to have to push soon. Like we're going to have to do this soon and just feeling really overwhelmed about facing that. Um, cause I, in my head and especially cause I had been going so slow in the afternoon that I was like, it's going to be another 24 hours at least. Yeah. Um, so that was like, also it was overwhelming. Um, yeah. Did you feel like, at least for me, I kind of, wa- yeah. I didn't want that labor to go that fast because I kind of wanted to have my baby with me still. I don't know if that's a yeah. feeling you had or if it was. Yeah, I de- yeah. I definitely think there was some of that. And, and I would think I was also really afraid, not necessarily like I was looking forward to seeing my baby, but I was also just like really afraid. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I think kind of what you're saying, like, it also felt like that was the end (laughs) and I didn't want to get to the end. I didn't want. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, but it went fast anyway. (laughs) Um, and, and then it was like 3am or so and they came in to check. So, I mean, close to 24 hours then after we had came to our appointment and they said, you're 10 centimeters do you want to push? And I still to the same kind of confused about what I was being asked. I'm like, no, want, like, I don't yeah. know. I had an option <laughs> once yeah. I was fully dilated. I was super comfortable. Like I didn't feel an, an urge to push with, cause my epidural was really doing the trick. Um, mm-hmm. but I, yeah, I was like, uh, I, I don't know. Um, and they're like, okay, well let's, let's try. And so that, and then they just had me push like a couple of times and then they said, let's give you a break and we'll come back in four hours. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, They're like, okay. try not like pressing your epidural button for a while to see if like you can feel the contractions more. And I was like, okay. Um, and then they came back in an hour <laughs> and said, let's try again. And I was like, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, so um, yeah. So then at that point, um, we started pushing and I started pushing and I had asked Chris that time because it had been just so, so quiet, um, in the room the first couple of times I tried to push. And so I asked Chris to play some music, um, while I pushed the mm. second time. And, um, so he put on some like bluegrass instrumental music on his phone, which we just like bluegrass a lot. And, um, so that was, that was nice. Um, but pushing was just like really emotionally horrible for me. I, the, the word daughter didn't occur to me until that moment. Cause we just, we, I had just been referring to baby as my baby and not as son or daughter. Cause I didn't know. Um, and even in the 12 hours since we found out it was a girl, like the word daughter just hadn't occurred to me. Um, and I just remember thinking, I'm going to get a hold of my daughter. Um, and I just broke my heart all over again. Uh, I don't really know why, but I just distinctly remember like that thought being really hard. Um, and, and I also just would fall apart between every push uh, or between every contraction. Um, I was just sobbing and, um, and it was just so, so quiet. Um, and like, again, like I've been in a lot of deliveries, um, to attend them, to take care of living babies. And I just know that that's not occasionally you're in one where the vibe is just very quiet, but usually there people are really encouraging and there's just a lot of talk. Um, and it was just so quiet and, um, I didn't have to push for too long. I mean, she was also very, very tiny. Yeah. Um, so it, I don't know how long I pushed, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then she was born at about 4.15 in the morning in the on morning. September 8th. 
what was your plan? Did they give you preferences or plans for after she was born? Yeah. Um, I guess that was another thing in their like list of things they kept asking us is they kept asking us, what, Oh, do you want to bathe her? Do you want to take pictures? Like, what are all the things? Um, and we had tended to just say yes to all of those, those things, those felt like the easier question. We were like, yeah, it doesn't feel right in the moment we can say no, but, um, so, but, so I had said that I wanted to hold her right away. And so they put her in my arms right away and it was just the best and the worst moment ever. Yeah. She was so, so, so little. She, um, she weighed one pound and one ounce <laughs> and she was 11 and a quarter inches long. So she was oh. a really, really tiny nugget. Um, yeah. but she was just so perfect. Uh, and again, I know this is, I don't know if this was your experience, but I feel like I hear from so many moms, like the silence at when the baby's born too, is just crushing. It's the worst. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was just another, another crushing moment, but the love I felt for her when I got to see her was just so intense. Yeah. <laughs> And then I feel like they just like, and then clean, clean things up as quickly as they could. And then everyone kind of left, um, which was fine. And it was just me and Chris, um, and just uh, staring at her. I, again, time, who knows what time even was, but, um, it feels like for the first couple hours that I just held her and we just stared at her. And I feel like for a while I was afraid to even touch her aside from holding her. Cause like, she was so little yeah. and I was so in shock. Um, and then like slowly just getting more comfortable, um, just holding her and kissing her and, um, and just seeing all the little features of her body. But yeah, I think, I feel like it was like, she was born at four and I want to say it was like until daylight that it was just like us in there just staring at her, um, with no one else there, which was really special time. Um, and then daylight came and, um, then our nurse from the day before came back, which was really nice. Um, and one of the things that they had asked us when we first came in was there's a really great organization in Pittsburgh, um, called the Pittsburgh bereavement doulas, and they volunteer their services, of bereavement doulas for anyone experiencing a stillbirth. So they'd asked if we wanted a bereavement doula and we were like, don't know what that means, but sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we had said yes. And she actually was one of the people who had come in uh, while I was asleep the afternoon before and introduced herself to Chris and had offered to stay. And he was like, I, I think it's okay. Like you can kind of come. And she was like, I'm available. If you need to call me, like call me this evening. Um, otherwise I'll come back in the morning. So she came back in the morning um, and she was wonderful and it was so helpful um, because she was able to help us kind of figure out what kind of memories we would make in that day. And um, it's like, you are losing a lifetime of memories and we can try to create as many of those as possible in today. And so many things that she facilitated or just ideas that she had that just wouldn't have occurred to us, especially like, I literally think Chris yeah. and I would have just sat there and stared at her, which also would have been a beautiful day. Yeah. Um, but it was really nice to kind of have someone coming up with ideas, um, of things that would feel special. So we, um, said we had looked forward to reading books with our baby. And so she brought in a bunch of um, children's books so that we could read them to her. And she, she suggested playing music that was important to us. So we like played our wedding song and, Aww. um, and then I'm sure Chris will talk about this, but his favorite thing I think is, um, she recommended doing like a father daughter dance to a song. So oh. he like danced around with her. Um, it was so, so sweet. Yeah. Um, and so now he ha- gets to have a song that's like their song. Yeah. Um, and we made footprints and handprints and, um, 
Um, she did a baptism. Um, and, and then one like funny Pittsburgh thing, she was like, is this, is she a Pittsburgh baby? And we were like, I guess, like, I mean, she was born here. Like I'm not a Pittsburgher in like a native, but yeah. Chris is. And, and there's, I don't know if you watch football at all, but there's, um, the Steelers yeah. have terrible towels with like the yellow towels that they wave in the stands. And she was like, well, this is a Pittsburgh baby. We need to get a terrible towel. And then she took it upon herself. She went to like five places. Like it wasn't easy to find, uh, but she was, we were like, it's really okay. <laughs> That's it's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> and so then we have pictures of her wrapped oh. in a terrible towel. <laughs> Oh, which is pretty funny. Yeah, that's um, great. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then one of the best things that she encouraged us to do, didn't really push us to do, but kind of strongly encouraged us to consider was inviting people to come. Mm. Um, Chris and I tend to be pretty private people. And I think we just like, didn't know if that was a thing that you invited people to right. come to. Um yeah. The social norms of like, yeah, yeah. this is yeah. weird. This is weird. Yeah. And I think if I had delivered a living baby, I think I probably would have been like, we'll just have it be us in the hospital. Like, you know, so it didn't mm-hmm. really, I don't know. I just wasn't sure what to do. Um, and so she encouraged us to invite people and I was like, I don't know, is anyone going to want to come? Does anyone yeah. like want to come see a dead baby? And of course my family was in Colorado. Um, but we called Chris's parents and we were like, well, you know, I mean, if you want to, and they were like, we'll be there <laughs> like we'll yeah. leave in five minutes. Um, and his mom was at work and she like left work immediately, uh, um, to come down. And that was really special, um, to get to have okay. them meet her and get to like, I don't know. I think in my head, I was afraid that if someone, she was so beautiful to me. And I was afraid that if someone came and had a negative reaction to her, that it would crush me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Valid, valid worry. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But instead they came and they like, I mean, they were heartbroken, but they also just like thought she was beautiful. Oh, Um, And so that was, that was so validating for my heart. Yeah. And then, and then we were like, well, that was great. Let's invite Chris's sisters. <laughs> um, so one of them, unfortunately was out of town, but the other one, same thing. We were like, I mean, if you want to, and she was like, I'm getting in my car right now. <laughs> um, so she came as well, which was really nice. And, and then kind of throughout the, so that was, I mean, by then, by the time they all came and it was like late afternoon on that day, um, And we had started to notice that her body was changing a little bit. And um, we just thought they hadn't given us any sort of timeline. I don't know if the hospital has a timeline for how long they would have let us stay with her, but none was told to us. So we felt like we were empowered to make whatever decision. Um, And they had like a, not a true cuddle cot that keeps the babies really cold, but they had like a, like a cooling pad. Yeah. They had like a cooling yeah. pad, okay. um, but we just didn't ever want to put her down. So we kept yeah. putting her on the cooling pad and then we would just like pull her right back out of yeah. the crib. Yeah. So it wasn't very effective because we didn't use it. <laughs> um, but so we kind of decided that we were afraid that if we stayed for another night with her, that her body would change too much. And I don't know, it felt like for us, it felt like caring for her to choose that. Like we didn't want her body to keep changing. Yeah. Um, and so we decided that we were going to say goodbye to her that night and Chris and I, they had given us like a booklet of like recommended readings and scriptures and, um, songs. Um, and Chris and I like had our own little, we called it like our own little memorial, um, that we like went through a bunch of those together, um, that evening and, um, just told her how much we loved her. It was just a really nice time together. And then it was finally like, I don't know, probably 11 PM. We decided that we were 
as ready as we might be um, <laughs> to say goodbye. Um, and we, they, another thing, they, there's a lot of things that have been donated to this hospital for babies who are stillborn, which we're so grateful for. And one of them was this little tiny bassinet thing, um, just for her size, like oh, a really? little crocheted or knitted yeah. um, bassinet. And it had like a parent keepsake. Um, so that the idea was that the baby would go in that and that you would keep the matching yeah. one. Um, and so we left her there. Um, in that and we chose to like walk her down the hall to the room where we were going to leave her rather than them taking her away from us um um, that was yet another horrible moment um and then I I luckily since I was recovering well they also let me get discharged that night um, because if I didn't have her I didn't want to be there um and so they discharged us like in the middle of the night and which was probably a blessing in a lot of ways to be able to leave the hospital lobby that's always so full of like happy babies and car seats Uh, and it was just empty um and yeah so then we went home (laughs) and you guys had been up also right yeah (laughs) basically for a couple days I mean yeah I'm sure you didn't have been like a little bit of maybe a nap or two in there but like yeah you're probably exhausted oh yeah we were so tired. So you guys went home and um, did you guys, so you did kind of a memorial service at the hospital together. Did you, did you guys decide how, um, it, if you were planning on burying her or cremating her or what was the plan? Yeah. Um, so we ultimately thought we just struggled with it a lot. Yeah. Um, and what we ultimately decided, one of the options they gave us was that the hospital could take care of cremation and, Mm, um, a local funeral home would like spread her ashes. Um, and so we opted for that. Yeah. Um, and it was fun. Like it was something I kind of struggled with for a while of like feeling a little guilty that we didn't get to keep her, um, that we didn't have a gravestone to go visit or ashes to, um, like an urn to keep special Mm -hmm. um and about six or seven months after she was born I was talking to my therapist about that and she said well do you think it would be helpful to know where she is what like what cemetery she's at and I said yeah but I'm not allowed to know like I signed the paper that said I wouldn't I don't get to know and she was like well I know people like I know someone that's in the um funeral like business here and it's a small community do you want me to find out and I was like I would like you to find out if you can and then the next day she emailed me and had found out what cemetery um she's at and it's right by Chris's parents it's not super close to us it's like 45 minutes from us but it's really close to her to his parents um so now we have a place that we can go visit her like she's there yeah that is really nice yeah. That was really nice of your therapist too. Like <laughs> I know. <laughs> She's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Oh. I know that like we will talk about this on uh, our other episode, but I I'm I imagine that coming home and being home was quite rough for mm-hmm. for a bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Um yeah. I will say one thing um that I had reached out to some of my friends, my friend who had come to like be with me in the hospital as well as a couple other friends. And I just said, I don't know what I physically need to recover from birth. Like I didn't research that. I don't, I haven't done this before. I said, can you get me to, can you figure it out and get me the supplies? And none of them have kids. So they didn't know. Um, And I said, just like buy whatever things I need. Um, And they, so when we came home from the hospital in the middle of the night on our porch, there was this whole huge basket of like all the supplies I needed, um, to recover from giving birth for like helping with my milk coming in. Um, and then like comfy pajamas and chocolate and teas. Um, and I'm sure so many other things, but it was just so, so kind. And I just remember being like, you know, the best friends are the ones that buy you diapers on the worst (laughs) day of your life. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but it was, I mean, 
it was really really horrible for a long I mean it's still so hard but yeah um those early days are just incredibly challenging yeah Michelle thank you so much for sharing uh, Lily's story oh I do have two last questions actually I was oh, thinking yeah. about it. I was like so when did you guys decide on Grace then the oh yeah name <laughs> Cause I know you were considering it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, um, sometime literally in the middle of the night, um, before she was born, we, um, had been like, we were literally Googling names of like, <laughs> and trying to figure out like, Oh, what sounds nice with Lily. And like, we're trying out some of the other names that we had talked about on our list. And we're like, Oh, does this go good as a middle name? Mm-hmm. No, no. And then we kept looking at like the meanings of names and we're like, we were like, oh, oh, like grace would be like a, like, that would be a nice meaning. What names mean grace? And then we're like, we could just do grace. Yeah. Let's <laughs> um, just do that. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's how we picked it. It's so beautiful. It's such a pretty oh, name and has got beautiful rhythm and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, And then tell me one thing that you want to remember about Lily and about this entire experience. What I want to remember and what I would want other people to remember is that Lily is more than just the fact that she died. Um, like that happened and it's horrible, but she is also, was also beautiful and perfect. And she's my daughter and she always will be. I'm so proud of that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting me talk about her. I love to.